The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. <laughs> okay, uh, welcome everyone um, to my talk today, uh, introducing MariaDB 10. Um, who am I? Uh, my name is Daniel Bartholomew. Um, I am a uh, senior technical writer and sysadmin for the MariaDB project. Um, I am not one of the MariaDB developers. I help the developers with their um, infrastructure needs. Um, and I work on the documentation for MariaDB. So if you have any questions that delve into the code, um, I'm not the one you want to talk to. Um, and I'm also not the one you want to talk to if you want to troubleshoot your database. <laughs> uh, just, it's not what I do. <laughs> um, uh, you can contact me, dbart at mariadb.org. Um, I'm also on Freenode. Uh, I hang out in the Pound Maria channel mostly. Um, I occasionally dip into the uh, Trilug channel um, and other channels, but hang out on there. I'm on Twitter, Daniel Bart. Um, I'm on Google Plus. Um, I am also on Facebook, but not if I can help it. Um, I do have an account, mainly because we have a Facebook page that's really popular. And so the only times I log into Facebook is when I need to post something to our stream, um, the MariaDB stream on Facebook. So, okay, so what is MariaDB? Um, most of you are probably familiar with what MariaDB is. Um, it started as a branch of MySQL. Uh, it was started back in 2009, so it's about 50 months old at this point. Um, uh, we've had several major releases. We started out with a 5.1 release, and then we did a 5.2, 5.3, 5.5. Um, we did a Galera cluster release, and now um, the developers are working on MariaDB 10, which is currently in alpha. Um, <laughs> our tagline that we've, that we've used is community developed, feature enhanced, and backwards compatible. Um, so if you want more information about what MariaDB is right now, the shipping stable version, um, you should attend Max Mether's talk. He's going to be speaking um, about MariaDB as it is right now um, yeah, tomorrow, 9 a.m., this same room, according to the schedule. Um, so that'll, that'll be a great talk. I encourage you all to attend that. OK. so. Why um, are we jumping from MariaDB 5.5 all the way to MariaDB version 10? Um, we've written several blog posts about them um, that um, I put, I'm putting the, the links. Um, I'll, I'll be putting links throughout the presentation. Um, I don't expect you to furiously scribble them. That's so that if you download the presentation later from the self website, you'll be able to have them there. Um, anyway. Uh, these blog posts kind of go, th go through some of the, um, the what, whys, and wherefores of it. Um, but in basically, um, MariaDB 5.1, MariaDB uh, 5.5 are version locked with MySQL. Um, we can't release, say, MySQL, I'm MariaDB 5.5.32 .5 until MySQL releases 5.5.32. Then, then we can pull in their stuff and release our version. <coughs> um, so the version locking, that, that has always caused problems. Um, when, we ha when we did our 5.2 and 5.3 releases, we could introduce things, we could fix things um, as fast as we wanted to because we weren't tied to the MySQL version numbering. Um, so that in 5.2 and 5.3, that was really good, but 5.1 and 5.5 were locked. Uh, so, for example, um, this, was, this is an example that I remember very well. This was um, probably a couple years ago. Uh, in MariaDB and MySQL uh, version 5.1.44, um, one of our developers found a buffer overflow. It was a really, really bad bug. Um, and they, uh, he discovered that uh, it was very easy to, um, to get elevated privileges um, using this buffer overflow attack. 
you know, it's priority one, you need to fix this right now. So we did. Um, we, uh, we fixed it immediately. It, it, it only took us hours to get it into the source code up on Launchpad. Um, and then the package release was in a couple of days. <laughs> the package release, you know, that's just because you have to build it on like 10 different platforms and seed the mirrors and all that. So, uh, but tried to get it out as fast as we could. Uh, the only problem was it was 5.1.44. 5.1.45 of MySQL was not out yet, so what do we do? What do we call it? This is not something we're going to wait for. Um, we have to get it, so uh, we called it 5.1.44b. And then a few days, a few days later, uh, MySQL fixed the same bug, but they came out with 5.1.45. But we have 5.1.44, so what's the first thing that people ask us? Well, I heard there was a really serious bug in MySQL 5.1.44, and they just released 5.1.45. Why don't you have 5.1.45 with this important, very serious bug fix in it? Well, it's just like, we do. And we had it like a week before they did, but we couldn't call it 5.1.45, so we called it 5.1.44b. Um, that's not ideal. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, Five, as I said before, 5.2 and 5.3 were much easier to manage uh, because we didn't have to wait. Uh, we didn't have to use non-standard version numbers. Um, also, uh, we had huge changes um, in 5.3. And so uh, the first thing that people asked us when we released 5.3 was, when are you going to have 5.5 out? And we're like, well, 5.3 is really big. We have all sorts of awesome features in here that you're not going to find anywhere else. But they still said, well, yeah, that's cool, but I want 5.5, because MySQL has 5.5, and we want 5.5. Um, but it's not, it, the, the 5.3 changes were so, we, we, we did a lot of changes to the optimizer, um, very deep into the optimizer, the core of the server, the thing that takes all your SQL code and translates it, actually does all the querying and gives you your answer back. We did a lot of, of really deep changes to that, so merging the two took a long time, and people didn't like that wait. Um, uh, just, just as an example, in MariaDB 5.5, um, it's the difference between MariaDB 5.5 and MySQL 5.5, uh, it's about one and a half million lines of extra code. Um, if, if it was a diff, it would be about 61 megabytes. Um, the only thing is, it's not a diff. There's no, there's no MariaDB patch set that you can just apply to the MySQL source code. Um, the changes are, it, it's, it's too deep of, of a difference. And so, um, you know, you go feature by feature, um, we, we are very careful to make sure that they're binary compatible, that the syntax is the same, um, <laughs> but there's differences. Um, and So also, so, so you have differences, you have um, version numbering issues. Um, there's also features. Um, MariaDB 5.5 and 5.3 and even 5.2 introduced features that are only now appearing in MySQL 5.6. Um, so we're, we're playing this kind of leapfrog game where we, we move something forward, they move, they move something forward, they're, they're moving targets. Um, Okay, and so uh, we, um, it's already hard when you say, okay, we, we, we have a guarantee that for the same version number, MariaDB 5.5, MySQL 5.5, you can move from MySQL 5.5 to MariaDB 5.5 without any configuration changes, without having to do anything to your data files. It will read the data files, it will read your configuration files, your apps will be able to talk to it, out of the box, no changes. Um,
you suddenly MariaDB is something very different than MySQL 5.5. Another issue that the developers ran into, particularly with MySQL 5.6, is someone at Oracle decided it would be a good idea to repack the code base. Um, which programmers like to do that, um, that's fine. The only problem is we're not using um, a version control system that can track a function when it's moved from file to file. Uh, we're not using Git uh, in particular. Um, we're using Bazaar, which is on Launchpad, um, the service run by Canonical. Um, and so what it's, what it's led to is there's huge losses in the commit history okay, from, from MySQL 5.5 to MySQL 5.6 because they've moved things around. They've reorganized the code base. Um, our developers, uh, when, they, when they saw that, they made the decision to know that the, the commit history, the, um, all the version, versioning and everything is too important. We don't want to lose that. So as we implement 5.6 features, we have to take them and move them back one by one. And so that, 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 that's an issue with 5.6. Um, and a reason why we're not we're not um, going to go to MariaDB 5.6. Um, there's also an issue of some of the code that's in 5.6. Um, our developers don't like it. Um, they don't like uh, for whatever reason. Um, I, I like I said I'm not a programmer. I don't know why is uh, why they think it's not good enough. But they'll take they'll take a feature and say okay I like the idea behind this feature, but I don't like the way they did it. Um, they did it. They did it this way, but if you do it this way, then it leads to this problem, so we're not going to do it that way. We're going to, we, we, to do it properly, to do it right, it needs to be done this way. And so, just because it's in MySQL 5.6 doesn't mean that we can just grab it and use it um, out of the box. Um, also, um, there are missing test cases. Um, any bug fix that goes into MariaDB, the standard is it must have a company test case. There must be a test that trips the bug, and so you can test. You say, this is before I apply the code, this test case fails. After we apply our code, this test case, this test case passes. Um, bug fixes in MySQL don't always come with test cases. Some do, some don't. Um, and so before we can put it in, our developers will put a, a patch from MySQL and put it into MariaDB, they have to write the test case. Now, sometimes they can get that from the bug report, but there are non-public bug reports in MySQL. Um, they, my, uh, Oracle has said that um, it, you just have to ask to get access to, to their, to their non-public bug databases, but our developers have tried and Oracle has not let them in. Um, that's also one of the reasons that, that distributions have, have given. Fedora gave that very um, reason why they're switching um, is because of these non-public, uh, these, these bug databases are, um, they have customer rules basically on, on the Oracle side. And uh, we're very strong believers that all of the, the bug databases should be completely open. Uh, that none of them should be hidden from the users. Um, even if, you know, especially if it's like a security bug, you know, you need to know what, what the bug is, what the code is that fixes it. I mean, we, we, practice, we do best practices. Have, we have a, a, a list for the early disclosure of bugs, and you know, just, just like um, you find in any industry, um, where we let the people who need to know, packagers for the distributions, the, the developers who are working on the fix, so they know what exactly it is, so they can get it fixed. But as soon as that is released, then that becomes open, just like it should. Um, and, and we have not we have not seen the same level of openness from Oracle. And so just to recap, why are we moving, why are we changing, instead of following the Oracle version number? Uh, I, I think that there, it boils down to four main things. We have, we want the flexibility. We want to be able to release um, bug fixes on our own timetable and not be tied to someone else's timetable. We want to be able to um, release new features new enhancements without having to wait. When, when they're ready to be released, we want to be able to release them. When, when something's been improved and is ready for um, wide use, we want to be able to release it. So the flexibility is very important. Quality is also very important. 
We want we we don't want to um, compromise at all ever on quality. Um, we want to be able to innovate um, without constant questions. Well, you know your version numbering doesn't match their version numbering. It's just like well you're right. You know you my skills on this version were on this version. That's the way it, it is in practice. So that's the way we're actually going to number it now instead of being tied to their version numbering and all the problems that that has. So basically, it comes down to we want to reflect reality, um, the way things are. MariaDB has advanced so far that it's time to make a break with their version numbering, and we figured 10 was a nice round number. Why not? Um, so MariaDB 10 um, releases. Uh, we've had uh, three releases so far. Um, our first alpha was back in uh, November. Uh, 2012, then we got the second alpha in February, um, the third alpha in April, um, the fourth alpha um, should be coming, I think, next week, I'm not sure. Um, the last time I talked to the developers on Tuesday, they were shooting for next week, dependent on, you know, whether or not certain things are ready. Um, why we're calling them all alpha is because 10.0 10 is not yet feature complete. Um, as soon as we, as soon as we release the beta, um, it's it, it's locked. The, all the features that we want to be in 10.0 final will be in the 10.0 beta. And so there's some features that just haven't been pushed into the source tree yet because they're not ready. And so that's why we're going to keep calling it an alpha until all the features are there. Then we'll call it a beta. We'll probably have a couple beta releases, a couple release candidate releases, and then finally it'll be stable um, sometime uh, late summer. Making good progress. Um, so, really be ten in a nutshell. Um, it's built on really be five. Um, uh, we uh, you should really go see the next next talk. Um, it includes backboarding features for MySQL. Some of the, some some features from MySQL five six, and we've just backboarded them. We've just taken them and put them directly. Uh, we also include re-implementing features, features that we think are great ideas, um, but we want to, for, for one reason or another, we need to um, redo them, or our developers feel the need to redo them, uh, and think that the time spent redoing them is better for, this, for the database. Uh, and then we have new features. We have a lot of new features in ReadyDB 10, um, just like we have a lot of new features in ReadyDB 5. <laughs> So backported features, uh, what, what are those? Uh, well, first thing is the InnoDB from 5.6, the complete InnoDB from 5.6. Um, we've always taken um, the upstream InnoDB as is, uh, mainly because it's excellent. It's an excellent, it's an excellent storage engine. Um, so any, any of the features that you may have heard about in um, MySQL 5.6 in their InnoDB storage engine, um, we'll have because we'll have the full InnoDB storage engine. Um, we'll also be including uh, Tacoma's extra DB storage engine, if you're familiar with that. Um, for MariaDB 5.1 through 5.5, we actually include, we actually had extra DB as the default for InnoDB. So if you said, you know, use InnoDB for the, for the um, table type, uh, it would actually be extra DB. Uh, but, but in our testing, we found that the InnoDB in MySQL 5.6 is faster. Um, it's, it's better than extra DB at this time. So right now, the default will be the InnoDB from MySQL. Um, second, uh, the performance schema. Um, if you've heard about that, it's, that it's a way to um, do low-level monitoring of your server for performance uh, characteristics so you can better um, uh, analyze and see where you can improve your performance in your database. So that, that's, that's backported from 5.6. Um, the online alter table, um, it has been back to back ordered as a way so that you don't have to um, lock your tables um, while, while, you're, while you're doing an alter. You can just do it online. Um, we love that, and so we back ordered that from 5.6. Um, uh, some of the optimizer changes we have um, done specifically the order by limit optimization, um, which can show, which you can use to show only a few rows of the order of the set. Um, we back ordered that. And then and there, there's others. Um, uh, re 
kinds of features, um, stuff that we that we uh, we have, uh, stuff, that, stuff that we've taken from ISO 56, but we've rewritten. Um, those um, include the uh, error messages uh, with the system error streams, so that you know it, it improves the error messages, so it's easier to figure out what it's actually saying and, and what the actual problem is. So we've taken those improved error messages, but we we uh, re-implemented it from from the equivalent feature in MySQL 56. Uh, the current timestamp as default for date time call date time columns. Um, this is a nice feature if you um, have a when you update a row in a database, you want to update the um, date time column with the current timestamp automatically. Um, you used to be able to do that, but only with columns that were of type date time. You couldn't do it with columns that were of type. I mean, if you could only do it with columns that were of type timestamp, you couldn't do it with columns that were of type date time, and now you can. Um, uh, that was a nice feature in 5.6. Uh, we re implemented it um, in, in what we think is a better way. Um, also, the global transaction ID. Um, this was a feature. Um, it was introduced in 5.6, uh, but we've had it since MariaDB 5.2, so for obvious reasons, we couldn't just take their version because we already had our own version, and so in 10, we have um, gone through and <coughs> tried to make them as compatible as we can um, so that you can use the global transaction IDs, and if you want more information on this feature, you can go there. That's our knowledge base. Um, the uh, global transaction ID feature is very nice for um, for when you have multiple servers and you're doing all sorts of transactions and trying to make sure that the, the binary one doesn't get out of, out of order or out of whack. Um, we also have um, parallel replication. Uh, that's a feature of 5.6 that we've re-implemented. Um, I don't know much about it, so I can't really speak to it. I just know it's there. And um, there's more information. Uh, this mariadb.atlassian.net, that's our, um, it's JIRA, it's our, it's our bug um, and word log. Uh, so, so a lot of the development information, all, all the development information, all the bug reports, everything gets put into that. Um, and then that is the task for parallel replication, so it has a lot of details about the implementation and what, we're, what our ideas are behind that. Um, Okay, let's talk about some of the new features that are in MariaDB um, 10. Uh, first up, we have our multi-source um, replication. This is um, a feature from, uh, it was originally developed by Taobao. Um, they're, they're a company that are, they, they do work on replication. Um, uh, the basic idea behind it is um, replicating you have replication, traditional replication, where you have the master and you're going to many slaves. Well, what if you have your data partitioned and so you have all these masters that have this partition data, but you want to do, say, backups or you want to do analytics or something, because um, so, the, the main reason behind partitioning your data is for speed, right? You want, you want to have so that it can go out and grab the information within just a couple milliseconds, you know, for, for a high traffic website, it's very important. Um, or just a you know, financial or travel, whatever reason you need, you need the speed. And so you have all these partitions, but what if you want, well, I need to back it all up, or I need to um, do run some analytical queries where I don't really, the performance isn't really an issue, but you know, it's more convenient to have it in one box. Well, now with, with, with this, you can take all of those and put them back on one box, on a, on a single slate, which is pulling from multiple masters. So um, kind, of a, kind of a fun thing. Um, like I said, big metal queries, complete backups, and things like that. Um, and um, more information on that is available there. <laughs> All right. Uh, other features uh, the exists to in optimization. Um, I'll be honest, I have no idea what that is. Um, more information is there. Uh, uh, Monty was really excited about it, um, uh, and uh, yeah, that's all I can say about it because I really don't know anything about it. Um, show explain um, for the thread ID to get the query plan for a running statement. Um, it's a good feature that we have in there. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, 
we've, we've improved Alter Table um, for the ARIA and my ISOM um, storage engines. Uh, just made them faster. Um, if you're not familiar with ARIA, ARIA is basically a crash safe my ISOM. Um, so it's, it's not transactional or anything, but for those, for, for those, you know, if you're using my ISOM now and you just need something that's a little bit more robust, you know, it basically acts like my ISOM, it has the benefits of my ISOM, you know, speed, whatnot. Um, uh, it, ARIA is crash safe on top of that, and so that's, that's nice. Uh, but anyway, we, we've improved the alter table so that it's much faster. Um, we also have implemented per-thread memory usage. This is another feature from Taobao, um, so that you can see uh, what memory is, memory usage is. Um, basically, you, you look it up in the information schema process list. We've added a couple columns there, so you can see the memory usage and the rows that are being examined. Um, and when you do a show status, it will show. It will now show you the memory usage, um, so that you can you can see how it's better better get a view of how your database is, is performing memory wise. Um, the information for that is available there at uh, MDEV 4011. All right, uh, another new feature that I think is kind of cool is the engine independent persistent statistics. Um, one of the um, nice, cool new features that I found in the InnoDB in MySQL 5.6 was persistent statistics. Um, the statistics are used um, when a uh, when you go to query a table, um, the the optimizer has to choose a query plan. It has to choose well, how how am I going to get the data or gather the data? And it tries to choose the one that will get you the the correct results the fastest. Um, but without without a way of knowing, without a way of, of gathering some sort of statistics about the about the table, it ha it just has to guess at what it thinks will be the fastest. Um, and so um, in MySQL 5.6, they do have this persistent statistics. It stores a little bit of information about the table, and then the operator can use that to choose a better query plan, choose a plan that will get you your results faster, get them in a more efficient way. Um, sometimes you can get them without having to actually test the data by just using the indexes. You know, very, it uses various options to try to get you your data as quickly as it can. Um, and so the persistent statistics are great, but in MySQL 5.6, they're only for InnoDB. And so we implemented one that was engine independent, whether you're using InnoDB or um, MyISAM or um, one of the alternative storage engines like Federated or, or uh, Spider or Cassandra or whatever. Um, the, the statistics are we, we, we can gather statistics generic way, um, which, which lets you, which benefits every storage engine. Um, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be written to support persistent statistics. Um, we, can, we can just do it for any of them. Um, yeah, so, so as I said, it, it, it's used by the, um, by the database to choose the best execution plan for a, for a SQL statement. Um, the, the plan that works the best. Um, and the statistics are also collected for non-index columns, unlike the MySQL 5.6 and OPD ones. So, so we, we've actually improved upon the OPD independent statistics in uh, MySQL 5.6, um, in addition to ex expanding it to all storage engines that just moved into the OPD. Um, you can find out more information about this um, in the MDEF 4145. Um, if you wanted to also look at uh, one of our developers gave a talk at the user conference. His slides are online um, at Percona, the Percona Live in, um, in what, Santa Clara uh, back in April. He gave a talk. His, uh, his name is Igor. If you go search for his talk, you can find out more information about that. In addition to the, to the development information there. All right. Um, another thing we've been doing, we've been working a lot with um, uh, partners. Um, other companies, and um, one of those is um, Fusion IO. If you're not familiar with them, they do um, high-speed cache flash storage um, for you know the dramatic flash basically changes everything in the database space. Um, and so we've we've added support for atomic writes on 
Fusion I.O. and Direct FS. Um, the, the reason I like this one is like when you uh, are, you have transactions, right? You have transactions because you want, you want your data to, to be um, safe. You want your data to, to get to the disk, when you want it to get to the disk. And you, um, so there's a few methods that you use to do that. Right, you have um, when you're using spinning platters, you how how do you make sure the data is on the disk and, and safely? Well, you the primary method of doing that is you write it a few times. You write it to the bin log, and you write it to the database file, and you query the file system has it been written, and you just hope that the file system is aligned to you because they often do because they have like cache back storage and stuff, and so they'll say, well, it's written actually will be in front of a few milliseconds. That usually works fine, but you know, if a power outage or meteor strike, whatever, it can you can have problems. Um, well we work closely with, with Fusion IO um, because in the flash space it, things are different. When you're when you're doing all this writing to disk, that, that can that can impact your wear level on your flash storage. And so you want to avoid unnecessary writes if you don't have to do it unnecessary. And so, um, using multiple writes to try to get to try to you know ensure that the data is written, you know you, you kind of need to do that on a spinning platter disk. But on a flash drive, if you can avoid that, that's great. And so they they um, they provide us with with some with some help to um, a feature of their DirectFS, which where you do an atomic write, and when it says it's written, you know it's written. It, they absolutely guarantee that it's written to their to their flash storage drive. And we. It, for the future, we, we implemented this on Fusion IO first because they were working with us. Um, there are other flash vendors out there, and we want to we want to expand it to everyone else. Uh, but Fusion IO is the first one to step forward, so they're the one that get the future version. Um, so the, there's more information um, at these these places. If you go to the knowledge base and just search for Fusion IO, you'll, you'll find it. Um, uh, we also implemented a better table discovery for uh, Federated X. Um, so that it can um, better get it. Federated X is its own kind of animal where, where, it's, where it's taking and talking to other databases, other My, MySQL and DDP databases on different systems as if they were local. Um, so it's, it, this helps improve that. Um, so even though, even though the original Federated Engine is totally unsupported, totally unmaintained, Federated X, um, we, we're still trying to improve that because some people find it very useful. And, and so the um, developer behind that has continued to approve it. We're very happy with that. Um, the, uh, the best new feature that I think is in Review 10, this is my personal opinion, is uh, this uh, transition to um, MariaDB, using MariaDB as a data platform. Um, as you know, there's a lot of databases out there. You have, you have the, the traditional relational database world, and so on. Um, and then you also have the uh, NoSQL world, you know, the, the um, single, the, the, the JSON, the, the schemaless, all that, all that sort of thing. Um, and, and we've thought for a while that you know, our, our goals are not that much different, we're just going about it in different ways. And so why should you have to completely change your tools simply because you're using a different data store. And so one of the, one of the things that we're doing with that is in ReadyDB 10, we're coming out with a Cassandra storage engine. Now what this does is it lets you talk to a Cassandra storage engine um, as if it was you know, just another storage engine. Um, there's some limitations, of course, because Cassandra is very different from ReadyDB. Um, and so you, it's, it's not like you can do everything that you would do in ReadyDB. Uh, with the Cassandra storage engine. But you can do all the basic things. You can do selects, inserts, updates, deletes, you can do joins, you can um, you know, basically talk to it as if it was just a regular, just a regular table in your database. Um, so there's more information about Cassandra at this um, uh, site. Um, and then I also have a couple of pretty pictures for you because pictures are nice. So, so this, this, this is one typical use case that I see for, for, for using the Cassandra storage engine. 
where you have like multiple ReadyDB instances, and they, excuse me, are they all are pushing data into Cassandra, and then you can then from the Cassandra storage and from from the Cassandra database itself, you can then pull out your um, uh, business intelligence tools to run reports and other stuff, you know, JasperSoft, the data stacks, all, all the ones that work with Cassandra, so you can have your readme database all feeding into a central Cassandra cluster, and then be running your reports off of that, while the databases are, are kind of separate still. Um, another one is, is just to reverse that, you know, say say you have um, uh, time data, like, like web logs, auto logs, system logs, things like that, and you want to do analysis on that. And so you're, you're, you have this Cassandra cluster that's receiving all of this logging data. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of unstructured, it's kind of uh, freeform, and there's a lot of it. And so you have a Cassandra cluster to, to gather it all. Well, then you can connect multiple MariaDB servers to that and multiple applications um, to the MariaDB servers to run statistical analysis and things like that. Um, and make, make that, that, that logging data available to your users without having to write a custom front end to Cassandra. Um, you can do it with the tools that you use now to, to query your MySQL and MariaDB databases. Um, you can, you know, so, so you don't have to learn a new system um, for, for your end users. Um, another way that we're, that we're doing um, MariaDB as a data platform is with the Connect storage engine. This is a very cool thing. Um, I, how many of you have ever used like the CSV storage engine? Ever used that? That's, that's the way, okay, Max has used it before. Um, the CSV storage engine was a way so that you can um, just talk to a CSV file, a um, separated values file, as if it were a regular database file. Um, well, the Connect storage engine takes this to the next level. It, it can read CSV, it can read that DBF, those are DBase files, it can read INI files, it can read XML files, it can connect to um, any other database using ODBC. Um, and so it, it basically is kind of a Swiss Army knife of connections to different file formats, different um, databases, uh, different structured data um, that you may have in your, in your organization. Uh, it can read and write to those. Um, so for example, using the Connect Storage Engine with the Cassandra Storage Engine, you can join data between your Cassandra database, your ReadyDB database, and your Oracle database and have a single query that queries all of them and then gives you a join against whatever. Um, you know, the, the, we don't want to dictate how or where you store your data. Um, you know, the, there, are, there are reasons to choose Oracle and there are reasons to choose Cassandra and there are reasons to choose MariaDB and we think that if we can make it easier for you instead of having to write a custom application that queries all three of them separately, let's, you know, use SQL. SQL is one of the most popular programming languages in the world. You, you know, be able, enable you to use SQL that I'm like, familiar with to query all of them simultaneously without having to leave the environment that you're and so I'm very excited about this one. The Connect Storage Engine docs um, uh, are available there. Um, the developer has written some really good information. So he goes through all of it with examples and everything, and how to connect to various data formats, how to um, configure and everything like that. So uh, that's a feature in, in Ruby 10 that I'm really excited about. Another one, uh, another uh, alternative database is a level DB storage engine. It will be similar to the um, Cassandra storage engine, but instead of Cassandra level, it lets you connect, connect there, and that the information on that is available there. I don't know much about level DB, so I can't really speak to it. I just know that the developer is working on it. Um, it's the same developer that, that has created the Cassandra storage engine, so he, I think he got excited. You know, finished Cassandra, it's like, okay, let's do what's next. So, all right, uh, some of the features that we haven't yet pushed into um, our alpha releases of MariaDB 10. Um, include uh, things like the Spider Storage Engine. The Spider Storage Engine is similar to Federated. Um, it is uh, just, it's, it's a storage engine for connecting to other databases. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's developed by this guy, um, Kentoku Shiba, I think is his name. He's out of Japan. Um, and that we're, we're, we're bringing it in. Um, and I, I don't know how it compares directly to Federated or Federated X, but um, um, from what I attended a talk of it a couple years ago about it, and it seemed pretty cool. Um, so it's just another way to connect.
index Korean EV to roll into that story. Uh, we're also um, Token EV, it's an alternative storage engine that was recently open source, and so we are uh, naturally, since it's open source, we are going to include it in Korean EV. Um, and so we have um, a developer who's working on getting that integrated. Uh, there's some things that Token EV um, has done that our developers are arguing with them about, uh, but that's just you know open source, so you always have those. So, but it will be there eventually as soon as they iron out the differences. And you know why did you do that? Uh, so they'll, they'll they'll figure that out. And um, initial documentation is there, but it's not really documentation. <coughs> that link will give you a page that has a couple links to the token DB site and um, find more information about that storage engine there. Um, <coughs> Uh, another thing that we're working on with uh, a company called My Diamo uh, from Penta Security, um, we're column level encryption. We're going to be including that. Um, so if you want to encrypt just a single column in your database, um, you'll be able to. Um, we're also working with Fusion IO for even more optimizations. And, and um, we actually, when we when we first talked about the, the Fusion IO optimization that we were putting in. Um, we, we almost instantly heard from several other huge, uh, mm -hmm. flash vendors. Mm -hmm. We also want to work with us, so, so um, uh, we expect that we're going to have many, uh, as, as we go forward, that we'll have many optimizations for flash storage, um, including Fusion IO. Um, and then, you know, this, this is an open source project. Um, anyone who wants to get involved can, um, and, and you can help shape the roadmap. So what is the roadmap right now? How does this, you know, if you're, if you're planning, if you're an enterprise and you're trying to figure out, uh, excuse me, um, you know, what, how, do I, how do I plan this, you know, I want to migrate to ReDB, you know, what's going to be in what version? So the roadmap as it stands right now, um, as I said, it's already a super set of features in MySQL, and the full MySQL 5.6 merge, we want, we want to take everything eventually. Um, it's it's going to be completed in two steps. The first is the current alpha releases that we're doing in the 10.0 line. Um, and then we will have a, uh, as soon as that is declared stable, we'll start working on a 10.1 series. And so that'll go through the same, the same process. And by the end of the 10.1 series, all the important features from MySQL 5.6 will be there with the first 10.1 stable release. Um, so that'll, that'll, that'll be coming. Um, um, so for all practical purposes, um, if you want to know, well, when, are, when will MariaDB be fully compatible with MySQL 5.6, that's the official word as I know it today. Um, it will be a drop-in replacement for MySQL 5.6, MariaDB 10.1, whatever it is, when we do that stable, um, will be a drop-in replacement for 5.6. Uh, all right. Um, some quick questions that uh, we, we get a lot um, about replication. People are always wondering, you know, they have, well, I have a, I have a, a 5.5 master and I have several 5.5 slaves. Can I drop in a 10.0 slave? You know, things like that, you know, just, you know, to, to kind of test the waters. And so can I replicate from MySQL 5.6 to MariaDB 10? The answer is yes. You can. Uh, can I replicate from MariaDB 10 to MariaDB 5.5? Yes, you can. Can I replicate from MariaDB 10 to MySQL 5.5 or 5.6? And unfortunately, the answer is no. So, so um, just just uh, the way the way that MariaDB 10. Um, uh, what kind of an animal it is? Um, it, it, if you're running a MariaDB 10 master. Uh, 
based off of Marine DB 5.5.30, .5 um, which can help with discovering what, what features the tool can enable. Um, we really encourage tool makers to start recognizing Marine DB for what it is because of our additional feature set. We have additional statistics um, that people can gather. We have uh, microsecond precision and other, other features that tools could really take advantage of. And if they just if they just assume that MariaDB is the same as MySQL for equivalent version numbers, then they're missing out on some good features that they could um, use to enhance their, their product. And so we, we really strongly encourage um, all tool makers to start uh, looking for specific MariaDB version numbers <coughs> and the features based on that instead of just assuming. Um, here's a big list of resources. So we have um, MarinaDB 10. Uh, the, the main information page for MarinaDB 10 is this, what is MarinaDB 10 page um, uh, on our knowledge base. And that uh, page is kept up to date with every release. So if you want, you want uh, all the bullet points of everything that's been released in MarinaDB 10 today, it will be in, on that, listed on that page somewhere. Um, we also have some blog posts which, are, um, which go into that. Um, uh, which are good if you just go to our if you just go to blog on readb.org. Uh, it's a good uh, we, we we tend to post lots of interesting stuff there. Um, let's see. Make sure I do this without going to the next page. Okay. So uh, resources. Uh, readb.org is the main website. That website is run by the readb. Foundation. It's not run by ISQL or multi program or anybody like that. It's, it's the foundation's website now uh, with the setup of the foundation. All bugs, uh, that's a short link that will take you to our JIRA instance. Um, our mailing list, the Maria Discuss and Maria Developers list, are great places. Uh, Maria Discuss you know, for users, Maria Developers for uh, people who are actually working on the code. Um, we're also on Twitter, Google Plus, Facebook. Um, our IRC channel. Is always uh, there's always someone from the company there, or some one of the developers is usually hanging out, um, and they kind of sort of spread all over the world. And that's just Pal Maria on Freenode. Um, and then our knowledge base is where we stick all of our documentation. Um, our goal with our documentation is to eventually replace the MySQL manual uh, completely. <laughs> but our priority is to document the new stuff first and backfill when possible. So we have. Um, the developers uh, and myself uh, try to work on documenting all the new stuff um, as quickly, completely as we can, and then we have some guys working on the backfill portion, uh, trying to make sure that that's, uh, it, it can eventually become a complete replacement for the MySQL man. It's not now, but if there's something that's not in the knowledge base, um, then you can just go to the MySQL site and it will be documented. So I guess before moving on, um, are there any questions? Anyone have? Okay. All right. Um, I thought it might be fun to to do some benchmarks. Um, oh, also the blog. Blog um, I thought it might be fun to do some benchmarks. Um, you know, so you have lies, and lies, and statistics uh, because statistics are always fun. Um, and um, this. Segmented my ISM key cache is one of my favorite statistics just because it is such an awesome looking graph. Um, basically, this, this segmented key cache solves a major read bottleneck for my ISM. It's been in MariaDB since like 5.2, um, so it's an old, this is an old uh, feature improvement, um, uh, but it, 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 it illustrates some of the performance things that we're doing. So, so you have you know, no key cache, and then you have with the key cache. And so, um, Major, major improvement in speed, which I think is always fun. Uh, another one um, is our batch key access. Um, and you can see up to a 10x improvement in our testing. Uh, with, all, with all, I, I forgot to get this thing. With all statistics, it's best to run on your own servers, on your own data sets, to find out if this works for you. <laughs> so, uh, but on our testing, um, we saw up to a 10x um, improvement uh, 
in his performance, uh, which was always really cool. And we also like it when um, people run um, statistics on their own and then report them to us um, so that we can get a real, sense, real world sense of, of the improvement. One of these was we have group commit in the binary log where you have all these commits coming in, and instead of writing them all individually to the log, group them when possible. Um, and so um, Mark Callahan at Facebook ran it. Um, so what you do, what you have down here, you have the original MySQL performance, and then then Facebook did their own patches. They had they had the version one of their patch, and version two of their patch increased it quite a bit. But then MariaDB took the Facebook code, and then we we were able to even improve upon that, which was really cool. Um, and so, so trying to, you know, our group commit is super fast and, and uh, big, big speed ups and um, Mark did the testing and, and uh, talked about it on his, um, he works on Facebook, so of course he posted it to Facebook. Um, uh, he was very happy about that because um, it solved some problems that they were having when you got above, you know, uh, he always had a problem when he got above like say 128, 256 concurrent clients and you would see his drop off in performance and we were able to keep it sustained out um, long past that. Uh, and then we didn't stop there because in, in 10 we made it even faster and we used a couple different methods, um, uh, removing checkpoints per commit, saving one in three F syncs, and then um, reducing the stall um, to get a speed up. And so this this shows um, this is comparing MariaDB to MariaDB. And so you have, you know, we were able to get a bigger bump. Um, so, so even even though it was really fast at 5.5, we managed to even improve it even on top of that in, in version 10, um, which is something we always like to see. We never want to see a regression. We hate those. Um, regressions are bad. And so trying to always improve it, always make it, always make it faster. Um, last, last pretty chart is comparing group commit in, because 5.6 house also has a group commit feature. They implemented, um, and so the, the, we, we of course ran a benchmark against it, and ours was still um, slightly better, which um, is always nice. So, okay, now now that I'm showing you the pretty picture. All right, any questions? All right. Oh yes, sir. Uh, workbench. Mm -hmm. Workbench is a real neat tool. Yes, it is. <laughs> Going forward, obviously, really is broken. It's going to be a whole different thing, like you said. Yeah. Is there any, those kind of tools, are you going to leave that to third party? Or? <laughs> right now, we kind of have to leave it to third party because we don't have the in house expertise to write a tool like Workbench. <coughs> and Workbench is an Oracle tool. So, um, you know, they, they're, of course, very free to support ReadDB if they want. <laughs> I'm just not optimistic that they will. So, um, I would hope that they would, but there's other Ruby tools um, that, that, that people are developing. And, you know, I think the market's open for someone to just up that space. Just yeah, yeah. And so I think if, some, if someone did write a tool that kind of replaced Workbench, I think they would see a lot about it. Because it is a very useful tool. People really like it, especially, I, I really like the modeling and everything that you can do. You know, but, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't today it doesn't support the ReadDB features. And so... And so it would be nice to have a tool that did. So I know on Windows we we ship IDSQL, but that's that's different from Workbench. It's just a GUI client. Um, but they've been very open to um, uh, supporting our to various features, which is nice. So, but that's that's a Windows only one. So we we could really use a Linux. Right. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Is there anything put out a cap or a lab staff? that incorporates MariaDB versus MySQL? Like a prepackaged staff? Yeah. I don't know if anyone's done that. It'd be nice if them to do that. Do you know of anything that? No. I mean, that would be the fastest way to get Maria in a lot of hands. Yeah. I would personally use it for our mm -hmm. sports site. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it, it, one, one thing that's nice is as, as we moved into distributions, then when you when you install their stacks on there, then it just works. You know, like if you if on Fedora when you install a LAMP stack, it will on Fedora 19 when you install a LAMP stack, it will install a okay. So, but but not, nothing nothing that's standalone that I know of. So I know I know there's like zero install LAMP stacks that you can just like untar and run with that I've heard of, but even all of those are with Max and operation. That's more fun. I'm just saying that might be an avenue that you guys have. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you know, because it'd be the fastest way to get, you know, into the hands of people. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know, I know there's, um, there's a company called Gelastic, uh, which, which does, uh, the, they're a cloud uh, company, and they, they have a um, instant configuration thing for Meridian, where you can, on their, on their servers, you know, you, you spin up these instances, and they, they have one that's specifically Meridian. So you can do that if, if you're doing that sort of thing. Um, we are working with the OpenStack people as well um, for like like the, the rack spaces of the world. Um, we're, we're trying to work on them right now. Their de the default for the OpenStack standard is MySQL, but um, we, we want to get in there as an alternative at least, so that you can choose it when you're configuring your virtual machine. Anything else? Focus like you can When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. 
the, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use. 
giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.